start right now. You know, I should say that we are not much of the readers. Uh, we are uh, looks like all writers. I, it reminds me on the old joke, actually, a Russian joke, uh, about one guy who came up to the Institute of Writers uh, named after writer Gorky. And he's taking exams, entrance exams, and they ask him, well, tell us what you know about Pushkin. Pushkin, Pushkin, he said. Uh, next question, please. They say, well, he, they tried different other literature, regions of the world and everything. And he said, look, you must be mistaken. I am enrolling in the department of writers, not the readers. <laughs> so looks like we all are a little bit, and I'm sure you haven't read our uh, uh, web pages about <laughs> our people. An example of Kathy Ellis's presentation actually showed, uh, proves very much that we are uh, all writers, not the readers, because she put a lot of weight and importance on the first written, very well prepared pages where the concentrated explanation of the soul system and principles and how it's self organized. But the people are not reading much. So, Kathy, you next time when you do this, you have to keep talking about what is written. So, uh, just to say that we are very happy to uh, make a, a closing session of this seminar with the presentation of Graham Brown Martin, who is uh, very uh, for me, for example, kind of a symbolic uh, uh, figure in the educational world since the time when I s discovered the uh, learning uh, uh, without frontiers and uh, I knew his name as the founder of it. And I believe already by that he forever left his footprint in the world of the teachers pedagogues, educators, and researchers working and exploring the bleeding edge of the, um, let's say, um, debate and discussion on education. So just, uh, you may already have found, uh, discovered by yourself that this is a very, um, anarchist type of the person, not a very conventional uh, uh, thinking. And I think that's uh, where he is just great at this. And uh, we are very happy that we convinced him to come here and to make us this presentation of his book, which was uh, asked for commission by the WISE Summit and which allowed him uh, to make such a deep and wide, at the same time, exploration of the most forward-looking uh, benchmarking uh, places and figures in education world, which is happening today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very warm introduction. I hope I can live up to it um, and, and not be too anarchic at the same time. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, I'd just like to thank uh, Emma, uh, Alberto, and, uh, and, and Gerard for, for putting on such a fantastic event. Um, you know, they often don't get as much credit as they deserve. So thank you for inviting me, and, and, and thank you guys uh, for, for, for this amazing event. So what I'm going to do in, in the time that I have available here um, is take you through a journey um, that, that led to the creation of, of this book. Uh, I've got a copy here so you can have a look at that uh, later. I'm going to leave it here behind with, with, with our, our hosts here. Um, and what led to it and, and, and how it was produced and, and why it's a physical book as opposed to a, an e-book because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's framed around technology and my career... Um, both in the, in the entertainment industry 
um, and in the education sector has all been around using technology. So the assumption, I think, was that uh, this would be a, a, one of those all flying, all singing, all dancing uh, digital books. Um, and I have it. You don't mind oh, okay, I can do. Oh, yes, you've got a camera, have you? Sorry. Oh, I, 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 I prefer to speak over there. <laughs> Sorry. It's a, anarchy. Um, I actually have it in my contract that there won't be uh, an e-book version, and we'll come to that in, in, in a second. So it, what is it? It's, um, you know, it's, it's really, a, uh, this is trying to put this into the academic speak, but it was really a global uh, exploration of how um, digital technologies, digital <coughs> platforms have impacted um, the way we learn, how we live, and how we communicate. And although when we started, I guess what I pitched to the World Innovation Summit for Education was a, a technology and education book, it really didn't turn out that way in the end. Uh, technology was used merely as a touchstone for much wider, deeper issues. And the journey in this book, it's, 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 in some ways it's a travel log, sometimes it's a diary, sometimes it's provocation, it's very magazine style. It's not a book that you read from cover to cover. It's not quantitative research. It's not no, it's, you know, drawing on what Joy was saying earlier. There's no measurements in here. It's the voices of many different people from all over the world. And it, it, you can hear my voice in it, so there is an occasional anarchic humor in there, but it's also not dumbed down. Anybody knows uh, Cole Pilkington, the idiot abroad, for example, on British television, will recognize some of that. There's also a bit of... Uh, perhaps Michael Palin in there, and, and, a, and, a, and a bit of myself. But it really did take me to the four corners of the world. How did I do that? It's interactive. It's a transmedia project. And what I mean by that is that it's always been, you know, as someone that was expelled from school and um, sort of very ADHD type person, I can't settle in one medium. So I had to work across multiple mediums. And so... There was, throughout the creation of this book, uh, online presence. There's learning-reimagine.com, which is a sort of my blog. It's my thoughts to myself. I sort of, I shared my notes, if you like. So throughout the creation of this book, um, people, the community, they had over one million uh, people visit um, the blog over the period of the project, um, felt they were participating. They were, my notes were, were shared by my working out, even the things where I was wrong. Um, or, or, or wasn't sure. I just put them out there and got feedback. So in a way, I'm not just the author of this. It's a number of people online, through Twitter, through Facebook, through a variety of different mediums, had an input into my thinking and creation of this book. It's also, we filmed um, about 50 hours of footage, four hours of which is currently available inside the book. Where, how do you do that, I, uh, you, you ask? All you have to do is when you go through the pages of this book, you find what they call active photographs. And then you just point your phone or tablet camera at the photographs, and then you get these documentaries. So you can, you can dive into this book and swim around. And if you want that whole digital thing where you can add your own chapters or add your own... So if you don't, you don't like what I've written about, say, Ghana or Qatar, you make your own video, put that on there, add it to the app, and it's available to everyone. So this is a, a sort of contextual hub for the future of learning. It's not fixed. And the reason is I make it physical is because I actually thought there's also there's a difference in what you put on, on print versus what you put on, on, on digital anyway. But it wasn't really so much that. I wanted something that was beautiful so that educators had a book which was beautiful. You can put that on your table and your non-educator mates, you know, the ones that work for architecture firms and all that stuff, and they've got their fancy books. You can go, like, check it out. No, 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 no. We have a beautiful book. So that, there was a whole bunch of reasons why I wanted to do it. And also, it was this idea. We hear it so many times, don't we, when we talk about the 21st century. It's all going to be digital. I don't think it is. You know, this decline of the physical economy um, is, is greatly exaggerated. As Malcolm McLaren once said, it's a difference between making love and screwing a rubber doll. We need the physical and I wanted to, create, I wanted to reinvent what the book was. So that's a little bit of explanation for that. These are the guys that were very kindly funded this project. And uh, it wasn't, because of the amount of travel involved, I couldn't really have done this on my own. And so this is a $1 million project. Um, you know, we were th uh, two camera people, a massive logistics team, lots of flights, etc. as you'll see in a second. This is my uh, director of photography, Nusha Tavakolian. She uh, lives in Tehran, uh, in Iran. Um, she's the most acclaimed young photographer 
the first eight publications she worked on were banned. Um, so we, 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 we got on very well. She was also dropped out of school at 15, so we had that in common. And she's the one that worked with me int intensely creating this book and photographing it. So there's a photographic narrative throughout the pages of this book. She won the Carmen Yak Photojournalist of the Year Award in, in this year, in fact, and then promptly gave it back to them because they were trying to edit her. So you could say that she's feisty, which is great. We, we got on like a house of fire. Anyone that could spend you know, so long on the road seeing me in my worst possible state deserves a medal. And we never had a single argument. These are, give me an idea, you won't be able to read this from where you are, <coughs> it's in the book, but you can get the scope of, of, of where we went. There was, um, you know, 120,000 miles, I, I'm reliably informed, is like five times around the planet in terms of flying around. Probably not a very good environmental footprint, I have to say. Um, pretty much went everywhere. We, from, we were in refugee camps in Syria at one moment, up a mountain in China after an earthquake, then we were out in rural Bihar in India, where there was no electricity, no phones, no television, no radio, on a maternal health care program, learning. So that was an interesting challenge. And next thing, I'm in the offices of Google. So this was a very varied look at the world. It wasn't one of those kind of education tourism things that government ministers do. Let's go and visit Finland. Let's go and visit Singapore. See if we can copy their stuff. It was much more looking at the um, wider context. And he also interviewed a number of, of, of well-known thought leaders. You'll recognize some of these people. Ken Robinson, Noam Chomsky, Kerry Faser, Alice Taylor, Mitch Resnick, Sigal Mitra, uh, the guy, Johan from edX, uh, Tilit Sully does a $25 tablet, these guys from China, uh, Pr uh, Principal Xu and Deng Fei. We then asked <coughs> questions throughout this project. When one of the, the, the first questions, and I think it's, it's been a recurring theme, I think, over the last couple of days, and, and Joe was, 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 was talking about this earlier, you know, what, what is school for? We just need to keep asking that question, and we certainly need to ask, what is school for now, when we see, you know, if we're, if we're going to believe there's this massive change afoot, well, what is school for now? So I asked a couple of people, I got this from uh, Seth Godin. Just one second, sorry. This gives you an idea of the videos that you can find in the book. And some of them are online. If you just Google me, you'll find them. Public education is only 150 years old and we built it with a specific function in mind. We built the educational system to train kids to sit still long enough to work in a factory. That's what it's for, to create compliant, obedient factory workers. So the question we need to ask is, what is school for now? We're not asking that question. Parents, administrators, taxpayers are not asking the question, what is school for? I have an opinion. I think what it's not for is to create more factory workers because we don't need more factory workers. I think what we need to do is teach kids two things. One, how to solve interesting problems, and two, how to lead. And yet if you look at just about any public school in North America or Europe, we're not teaching that. We're teaching kids how to do well on the test instead. So that's Seth Godin, so he, he's really in a way, summarizing some of the things we've heard over the last couple of days. We heard it from Kathy at the beginning of, of, of the conference. We heard it from Joe as well. You know, it's just, is it really about getting kids through the test? And, you know, and I, I like the idea of taking the tests away completely. But I also wanted to get a, a broader canvas of opinion, so I asked Noam Chomsky at MIT. And, of course, there are uh, sharp differences on, on this matter. Uh, there's the uh, traditional... In, an interpretation that comes from the Enlightenment, which uh, holds that uh, the highest goal in life is uh, to inquire and create, uh, to uh, uh, search the uh, riches of the past, uh, try to uh, uh, 
internalize the parts of them that are significant to you, that carry that quest for understanding further in your own way. Uh, uh, purpose of education uh, from that point of view is just to help people uh, uh, d determine how to learn on their own. Uh, it's you, the learner, who is going to achieve uh, in the course of education, and it's really up to you what you'll uh, uh, what you'll master, where you'll go, how you'll use it, uh, uh, how you'll go on to uh, 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 produce something new and exciting for yourself, maybe for others. That's one concept of education. The other concept is essentially indoctrination. Uh, people have to, the idea that from childhood uh, uh, young people have to be uh, 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 placed into a framework in which they'll uh, follow orders, accept uh, existing frameworks, uh, not challenge, and so on. And this is often quite explicit. And so, for example, after the so what Chomsky's talking about there, really, he, he, he's, he, he's really, I mean, this is not a new conversation. I mean, this guy, I mean, you can pick up The Child and the Curriculum, 1902, by John Dewey. Uh, it's free, you can just download it. It's worth reading from time to time, just to make you realize how old this conversation is. It's got nothing to do with 21st century skills and all this kind of stuff. It's just about this sort of almost a false dichotomy Dewey presented, which was the, um, the curriculum as a thing that drives... The, the, the learning, drives the outcome, drives the means, etc., like a factory type model. And we heard about Frederick Taylor uh, at the beginning. And versus this um, self realization, the self actuation of, uh, of the child themselves, following their own um, course of study and interest. And I think it's a false, uh, Dewey presented that as a false dichotomy because, of course, um, you know, subject matter is important, but also the realization, the self realization of the child is important. I mean, we have quite clearly, I think, and we'll see as I go through this talk, um, ventured into um, what I suggest is a, an industrialized version, which is really more about shoving it in. We've seen, we've seen a number of examples. We've seen the turkey with the computer being stuffed into it. We've heard from Joe. Um, we heard from Kathy, which is this idea of just industrializing the whole process and forgetting what we were doing it for in the first place. So I came up with a number of conclusions. And... You know, it's very hard, actually, for me to sort of tear myself away because there was so much stuff. I was swimming around in this for a number of months and goofing off on Facebook, as any of my friends will tell you. But I, I, I brought a number of conclusions around these subjects. Of course, you can draw your own conclusion. The way the book's styled is for you to draw your own conclusions. But around context, environment, engagement, technology assessment, and the future. So let's go through those uh, briefly. Let's talk about context. Think about context was... <laughs> You know, this word transformation, um, it was like, wow, did you find transformation in, in education? You know, as if I would know it when I saw it. Um, the thing is, what I discovered here was it was contextual. So, for example, this gentleman, uh, Colin McElwee, world reader, their intervention in education was, is, is, in, is in West Africa, in Ghana. Now, Ghana, like many countries, is an is a ex-British uh, colony. Um, and the, the British, of course, exported their education system, um, which was a pedagogy based primarily around books. Uh, we, we still have that, of course. The only problem is, is books, you know, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, they're heavy, you know, they're expensive to distribute, um, they get out of date, they don't last terribly well uh, in, in, in harsh conditions, and so they had a pedagogy based around books, um, but they didn't have any books, that is. And so what they did was they used the very cheapest uh, Kindle initially, and now just any e-book, they have an e-book reader that runs on mobile devices. But the Kindle's kind of interesting right, really, because when I first heard about this project, I sort of poo-pooed it, because I first heard about it when I was in my iPads are wonderful days. And before I discovered, actually, iPads aren't wonderful for everything. Um, and what it was was that you know, the, 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 the device lasts an awful long time on one battery charge. It's, you can read it in the sun, which is kind of useful in Ghana. Um, and also, the, the kids took them home. So suddenly, they'd gone from no books to having a 1,000 books, which they took home with them. I mean, the literacy is not such a big problem. They could read, they didn't have the books. And now the teacher can plan their lessons knowing that they've all got books. 
And this was a, a maze that, that was transformative for them. And you could argue, well, you know, go on, book-based pedagogy. That, the problem is, is that they would have been fighting tooth and claw to get any kind of change in pedagogy from the government. So this seemed like a, a good insertion, a good intervention. Now, in India, the lady you see there, and this, the lady here is an ASHA, is a healthcare worker. The, um, the lady there is pregnant. She's not allowed to leave her compound. Now, I'm not getting into the politics about this. This is the reality of, of that. I mean, you know, I'm sure most of us would not agree with that. But in, in rural Indian families in Bihar, it's quite difficult that the, the mother-in-law is the boss of the household. Her, the, the mother's role is to have children look after them. That's how it is. But the thing is, we're dealing with a society which is illiterate. They have very little power, like no mains power at all. And maternal, health, you know, maternal mortality is very high. Women are dying. Children are dying. So BBC Media Action worked out how, what would their intervention be and, and could it be around electronic media. Now, they have phones there that are knockoffs. You know, there's, there's no iPhones and stuff. There's no internet. There's no Wi-Fi. But they have phones like Samsung and Noia. I mean, it literally ripped off phones. But it doesn't really matter because no one can read what they say anyway. But what they did is they delivered a system based around interactive voice response and, and, and short codes that the ASHA, who was trained also by a mobile device, can take out. And it's one of the biggest mobile learning projects in the world. Hundreds of thousands of people using it, saving lives. So there, we're looking at a transformation that wasn't about, oh, we gave every kid in school an iPad, and suddenly everything changed. So transformation for me was contextual. Environment. What do I mean by this? The environment of the school is important. And we sort of say, well, yeah, of course it is. But then look at some of our schools. You know, you could really draw parallels between schools and prisons or other institutes. This is high-tech high. But one of the things I saw in, an, in all, pretty much all the schools I went to, whether it was high-tech high in San Diego or a madrasa in, in, in Amman in Jordan or in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Nave, or ESA Academy in, in Bolton, I can just go on, they're all in the book, was that the environment was key. You go into high-tech high, it's very difficult to know where the classroom ends and the common areas begin. One of the things they were doing, we've heard a lot about this over the last couple of days, was that the curriculum wasn't driving things. They would mix things up. So you'd have Spanish with physics. You'd have you know, carpentry with um, fill-in-the-blank maths. You know, it was just this combination of things. It's very difficult to work out who was a teacher and who was a learner in that kind of context. It was very much like where I had been a few days before, which was the design studios of IDEO in Silicon Valley, or Google. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Google. What I'm saying is, is that the expectation of these young people had been raised. These guys were not planning uh, a career in retail, for example, or working in a factory. It does beg the question then, of course, it's these schools are doing this. And I, I visited Wellington College, which is a very expensive private school in the UK. Beautiful environment, amazing. Uh, and it also has a very similar interaction between student and, and teachers. This, you know, the ones I'm dealing with there are state schools. These are not private schools. Well, it was a private school. But the point was, was the environment and the way teachers engaged with the students was very different. In much the same way that Joe was talking about earlier. The environment does, I, I, I believe, and what I saw, qualitatively, matters. Engagement. I think that you know, Joe covered this brilliantly. Engagement of the, of the teacher. Engaged teachers is vital. And engaged teachers, you get engaged students, engaged learners. It's so often missing because... You know, we, we, you know, I don't want to go over Joe's excellent presentation again, but measuring, 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 testing, 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 not trusting the teachers, de-skilling teachers. No wonder they're disengaged. Not being, you know, I, you know, I, I have spent time in schools where I've found fantastic practitioners, only to hear from their colleagues that they're problem. They are problem because they're raising the expectation of the kids too high. So when they come to my class, they're bored. Can you imagine? It could have been Joe. 
Do you know what I mean? Joe, will you stop doing this? The kids, they want, they want you. I can't teach them. You're a bad, bad man. That, and that's actually happening. So you get disengaged teachers. So engagement was vital. You know, I went into a, a school in Dubai, desperate to impress me with all their technology. I mean, this is a proper private school. I mean, they had everything. You know, when you do the chemistry class, there's a 3D projection system to teach chemistry. So I'm literally sitting there, and I'm disbelief, really. This amazing teacher that's just, just wonderful, engaging. And she goes, right, now we're going to switch to the 3D. And they all put these glasses on. It was like something from the Jetsons. That was good timing, wasn't it? <laughs> it's like that. And the point was, that, you know, they were trying to impress me with their technology. I was just impressed with the teacher. You could have taken it all away. You could have taken the whole class away. It's like, it's like, it's like theatre, isn't it? Theatre is one person, another person. You don't need the rest. So this technology was just irrelevant. It was education plus technology. So, I mean, to impress the parents. A, Dubai is a market economy. How, you know, I want to get the, you to send your kid to my school. Look, we have a 3D theatre. Look, we have gold-plated iPads. Therefore, we must be good. No. Engagement. Engage, te engage teachers. Technology, then, which was, of course, the, the point of the book, which that's what I sold to the Qatar Foundation. If I'd have written this book 10 years ago, I guarantee you it would be gathering dust in your collection of books that you already have that tell you technology is going to save education. <laughs> Fortunately, I've, I've kind of balanced out a bit. I haven't become anti-technology at all. I've made my entire career uh, and, and, and livelihood from technology. But what happened is, is when I was running Learning Without Frontiers, we were having a dialogue which I thought was going in this direction, which is about how we could use technology to liberate the teacher, liberate the learner, create new conversations and dialogue. That's what I thought we were having. That's the conversation I thought we were having. But it occurs to me, what's happened is we've hit this fork in the road. One group's going over here, one group's going over here. This group is much bigger. This group going over here is buoyed up by venture capitalists, ed tech companies, Silicon Valley idiots that don't get out enough. Because what they want to do, what they think, is that teaching is a delivery system. They can turn it into an algorithm. You can use learning analytics. You can use big data. Gosh, we use big data. We'll know exactly how, you know, where the child's having difficulty. And then we can, you know, boom, give them some learning. Just deliver it like a shot. So I think Let's the issue with these massive investments in technology is that some of them are going to be beneficial. There's no doubt that that sort of thing changes what it's possible to do. But at the same time, unless people have had the fundamental question, the fundamental conversation about what you think education is for, this stuff is essentially pointless. You want to turn it on? Yeah. Sorry, that was a bit low. What, should, what, what, what Kerry, Professor Kerry Facer at Bristol University is saying is that if we don't actually ask what education is for, if we don't ask what schooling is for, the technology will have no impact at all. And she's absolutely right, of course. You know, one of the places I visited was Cuba. Wonderful, 100% literacy, exporting like, medical workers and surgeons and, and scientists like you wouldn't believe to support the American healthcare system. Don't appear on PISA, of course, because you've got more sense. No technology at all in the schools. So you could, you could argue that you know, technology, not only is it not neutral, it's actually a distraction. But it could be that we're measuring the wrong things. So just, get a pair, a, a, you know, just to put that in mind, I mean, lots of schools, loads of technology, but you know, that still don't have 100% literacy. Go figure, right? So back to the point I was making about this fork in the road. One group is this group of people, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be generous and say they're well-intentioned, well but a reductionist view. You know, it reminds me when I used to run free parties uh, during the Acid House era, you know, 10,000 kids in a field drinking water and dancing like demented orangutans. A whole bunch of scientists approached me and said, we wanna, can we come along and we want to understand why people are enjoying themselves? Can we you know, de deconstruct the rave? that we were doing, and then reassemble it somewhere so we can understand it better. Of course, it wouldn't work. You know, it's like you deconstruct a rave and try and put it together in a sort of scientific controlled, measured experience. <laughs> I mean, even if you added drugs, do you know what I mean? It, it wouldn't work. 
And it's the same is true, I think. You know, my experience of going around all these different schools everywhere on the planet, not just a few controlled ones, was that was the case. It's not something that you can just, you know, it, it's not, it's, it's just reductionist. But that is happening. That is happening right now. You know, we're having this big conversation about learning analytics. This is Taylorism. This is exactly what Cathy was talking about. This is putting computers so you can hand the data back to the management, de-skill the teachers completely. We're not going to have teachers like Joe. We're going to have technicians. Just wheel them in. There's even press cutting I have, which is a, a, a government minister saying, the end of teaching, the imparting of knowledge, no more for teachers. They can just do that human stuff. I call bullshit. The other course, the other, the other, the other strand, which don't hear, we hear less about now because the, the venture capitalists aren't investing in it, is this idea of what, 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 would, what would learning be? What could it be in the information infrastructure? We know about education in the industrial infrastructure, but now in the information infrastructure, what would that be like? Why? You know, the Victorians, as Ugarta Mitra told me, Victorians used modern technology in their examinations. The modern technology of that time was pen and paper, pencil and paper. We, on the other hand, don't use today's technology in our examinations. We still have that sit-down situation where you're not allowed to talk, you're not allowed to collaborate, you're not allowed to be creative. What if we insisted that every child had to have a connected device, they had to talk to their neighbour, they had to call a friend, they had to find a global subject specialist and solve a problem? They couldn't cheat, you know. I used to cheat. I used to put stuff, you know, we all did it, you know, write, write the answers and the formula on your shirt or in the back of a log table book or something like that, show my age. You know, you go on YouTube and type in cheating in exams. There's thousands of them. If you don't have that kind of remembering, regurgitating, vomiting out facts examination, everything changes, doesn't it? You know, or as Joe says, maybe just remove the uh, high stakes assessments entirely. So, assessment. So, I, I, the, thing, the, the sad thing is I found all these fantastic practitioners everywhere. I found great practitioners. I mean, it wasn't a surprise because I selected them. <laughs> but the point is, we all got to that but, yeah, but at the end. Because all this great stuff, they still had to then put their kids to the state exam. Quest to Learn in New York had a problem because... They realised that initially their grades went down when they were using uh, game-based metaphors within teaching practice. I'm not talking about video games. I'm just talking about you know, adventures in maths, adventures in biology and so on. What they'd failed to do was teach kids how to pass tests. And we hear this nonsense about the PISA thing, you know, the unelected Olympic Committee of Education, saying, oh, well, look, you know, look at, the, look at, the fin look at Finland, look at, look at, look at South East, look at Asia. Look at how amazing they are. But the thing is, if you follow them, Asia have always been good at passing tests. You know, the British got the idea of, of, of that kind of assessment from the Chinese and then expanded. Why? Because the British Empire wanted lots of clerks. So when they expanded their empire and arrived, it was like, oh, we've got people who can write this thing, do the typing and fill in forms. That's what you wanted. That's the education system that we have today. So assessment is this thing that is the tail that wags the dog of learning. You know, we are testing, as we know, I mean, I, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. We are testing the wrong stuff. Quite clearly, testing the wrong stuff. So really, you might as well forget about using technology in education because we, we still have a, a system which is all about fact record and regurgitation. And I think that conversation's been done to death here. What we don't have at the moment is a realistic model for going forward. But assessment is a major problem. So when people say, well, what transformation did you see? And why is it not scalable? It's because of this issue. Simple. If you want to disrupt education, if you want to transform education, assessment is what you have to disrupt. That's the thing you have to change. You know, forget Khan Academy. A load of nonsense. The sense in which that's true, true of testing. I mean, that the... Oops, sorry. There's a... We... I think... Sorry, that was my fault. The sense in which that's true, true of testing. I mean, that there's, there's a kind of benign view of testing, which is that it's, it fulfills necessary purposes in relation to keeping track of standards, accountability, uh, 
and in providing certification you know, and qualifications for progress to the system. So, you know, there's a benign way of looking at it and saying, well, it meets those important purposes in education, and there's something to be said about that. Um, what's also true is it's a massively profitable enterprise for publishers. Uh, it's one of the, the engines of the education economy. And the debate isn't about should we get rid of testing, but can we produce more interesting, you know, more, uh, more expensive forms of it? I mean, in America, states spend you know, billions of dollars on testing systems. It's, it's a big business. And so it makes it difficult to, to have a reasoned conversation about it with people because there are lots of us interests. Like in the environment, you know, a lot of the arguments about uh, oil and coal uh, aren't being held in some, neutrally, some neutral ethical space. You know, you're, in the environment, there are massive vested interests. You don't want to be looking at clean source of energy because their profits lie in the existing source of energy and they'd rather keep it this way until they're exhausted and then they look for some other way of making a profit. And that's not being cynical, that's just a matter of fact. It's, it's how the, the markets work. And there's a market in education for these things. So when, when we talk about testing, it, it's, a, it's a rather complicated picture. If you look at it from a purely educational point of view, as opposed to a, um, an ideological uh, point of view or, uh, or a commercial point of view, Education can function perfectly well without tests of the sort that we're, we're currently used to. And, and it may be able to function even better in future without them because um, you know, one purpose of, 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 uh, of testing is to monitor students' progress. Well, there are better ways of doing that than from, you know, from standardized competitive testing. That there are uh, teacher reports, there are peer group reports, there are portfolios that can be given. If we're just interested in making sure that people are making adequate progress, I mean, you know, the occasional diagnostic test is fine. But there are better ways of doing it than sitting people down ritually and routinely. And So what Ken Robinson is talking about there is this sort of, what we might call the education economy. I think Cathy, if I'm right, I think it was, Cathy had a slide, or somebody had a slide, was the uh, education industrial complex. Um, and that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. This is big money, huge money. You know, we talk about state education, public schools. They're all private. Why? Because the companies that own the awarding bodies own the content. So state-provided education, but with a monetization model owned by Pearson or McGraw-Hill or fill-in-the-blank commercial company. They're like the tobacco industry. Do you know what I mean? They have... Here's the test and here's the content. And, that, and Ken's absolutely right. It's like, actually, what we need is more sophisticated testing, and it's going to cost you a trillion dollars, please. That's what they're doing. I think the problem is, is that we take parents seriously when we hear them say, oh, I just want my kid to get these qualifications, or I just want my kid to get into this university. And what we hear is that they therefore want an education system that is about exams and is about results. I genuinely think that what the parents mean in those situations is I want to get security for my kids, I want to get well-being for my kids, I want them to be able to live well in the world, I want them to be okay when they're in old age. And I think the mistake that we've made is we keep having the conversations about the proxies, the exam results, the certification, and not about the more fundamental questions, which is what does it take to live well in the world? What, what is it that we're going to need? So an interesting point, are we just worried about the proxies? This comes back to what Joe was saying earlier. Like a fantastic warm-up act, but the point is, is you know, what do we really want? What do we mean? You know, we, we've been conditioned. I think it was the point that was made earlier into believing that you know these grades mean something for a better future. Of course, we know that's a lie. So the future, <laughs> uh, we touched on this the other day, and 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 um, with <laughs> Helen, we had that little kind of session there, and I, I feel a bit bad, a bit rough, but it wasn't personal. It was just meant about this issue that we keep hearing, this thing called the future like it exists, like it's a place. It's not a place. The future doesn't exist. You know, it's like this idea that, oh, well, processors double in speed and get half the price and everything else, therefore we're all going to be plugging the internet into the back of our heads. And, and Yes, it could look like that if we allow it to. You know, we, society, have agency. I mean, <laughs> this, we sort of imagine that the, you know, the whole of democracy and politics has been driven away by this thing called technology. You know, it's technological determinism, isn't it? 
I mean, and then there's the economic determinists who, who, are, who are fixated. And then there's this like, bastard child of the economic determinists and the technological determinists. You've got Silicon Valley and the stock market, eye-wateringly high uh, prices of shares and so forth. So the media covers it. You know, Apple, launch a new phone, stop the press. You know, you'd think they'd found a cure for cancer. Do you know what I mean? But no, it's a new iPhone. It's just you know, implausibly plastic and it's thin and it's wonderful and it's fast and you have to have it. So this is a real problem, I think. You know, and then we talk about like, the democracy. We give so much power to these very large companies who we didn't elect. I mean, Facebook, for example, as we know, did that experiment without telling us to change people's emotions. So imagine if they changed democracy. We need to wake up on this issue. We have agency. Technological determinism, the idea that it's got to happen, therefore education has to fit around this plan, isn't the case. You know, we can say no to some of these things. We can, we can switch them off. I'm not saying that we, we end up not doing technology. I'm just saying the future is what we make it as a society. And if we decide that having the majority of people poor so the minority can be well off, we, change, we decide that's wrong, we can change that. You know, the strategy of keeping Africa poor and diseased and the Middle East at war doesn't have to be like that. That's a strategy. We have agency. We can decide how this ends up. This is down to us. Education plays a big role in that. And it's not that education needs a reboot. Society needs a reboot. So the future, is what I'm saying, is, is what we make it. And it sounds like I'm being idealistic. I, I, you know, I give a talk about what's going to happen in, in this century, you know, in terms of population, in terms of... Uh, antibiotics not working in terms of lack of water, so forth. That gives you, a, you know, an idea of why education. You know, education could be for the well-being of society, so, you know, solving these bigger challenges. The world is only worth saving, of course, if there is peace, if there is joy, if there is love. You don't want to be the last person on earth with a last glass of water, some psychopath somewhere. Do you know what I mean? And of course, if I'm wrong, does it really matter? You know, what if we create a better planet and it's just a big hoax? Why not? Um, the notion when I first taught, I can say, was 37 years ago. And the narrative when I first taught was school reform. And the narrative today is school reform. And the narrative every day in between has been school reform. So school reform doesn't mean all that much to me as a, as a term of art, but I still stand on the shoulders or, or, or like to try to of John Dewey, um, who in 1910 said, I'd rather have one school former than 100 school reformers, meaning one school creator than 100 school recreators. So I, I look for, I think that what we need are, is sort of, is, is, is a lot of innovation of a lot of people, not just doing schools like this, but doing all kinds of different schools of their own stripe that some, they take some of the elements from here. And I'm really seeing that. I'm, I'm these, these nuns who we're working with in one place, this Anglican church, girls' school, another. I love that it's so sort of polymorphously perverse, as Freud would have said, is that it's not about religion, it's not about anything, it's just about people who are realizing that what they're doing isn't working anymore, and, and, and these are our babies, these are our children that we love more than anything in life, and we've got to do better by them. Larry Rosenstock, and I, I wanted to put that bit towards the end of my presentation because I absolutely believe him to be right in, in the sense of, you know, in the UK and in other parts of Europe, by law, I have to hand my children over to the state apparatus when they're five. I don't want them being taught by technicians. I don't want them being taught by factory workers. I don't want them being taught by someone who's just going through a burger flipping manual for kids. I want my children to be taught by artists and craftspeople. I want teachers like Joe to be teaching my kids, and I think we all should have that. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, thanks for that, Graeme. 
a bit of a link between Joe and, and some of what I was aiming to put across and what we've just heard from you, Graeme. Um, and it's part about being there and paying attention to your students. And, and, and I won't say where this has been, but in a number of places I've been recently where I've been um, both depressed and impressed at the same time at students who, for all intents and purposes, the system has given up on, have got into conversations with me and they've, and they've what's lyrical about their YouTube channel that they, that they, they have. And a student last week, he, he, he told me, you know, oh yeah, I got $1,000 last month from my YouTube channel. The sad thing is that our system and you know, the assessment and, and so on, the teachers didn't even know we had this activity. They're not even looking for things that can be scaled up and transferable, et cetera. And, and, and I just wonder in terms of assessment, how we break through that, you know, how, how we break through that and start to value things. Um, and from your journey, you know, have you seen any? Have you seen any glimpse of inspiration like that, where you get, it gives you a bit more hope for the future? In that we are beginning to look for ways to value, you know, what the, those really important um, attributes, uh, aspirations, ambitions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in our young people. Hello. Yeah. Um, in regards to um, practitioners, I think this is. Feedback. Hang on, just one. In regard to um, practitioners, I, I saw, I met, I mean, pretty much all of the practitioners I met were inspirational. You know, they were all innovating within the limits of, you know, this, this final assessment and, and all that kind of business. So, I mean, I was very fortunate in that wherever I went, whether it was, um, as I say, in a refugee camp or, or in the middle of a, you know, a field in India, or, or in, in the Western world, I found uh, practitioners that were similar to, to Joe in terms of their passion, in terms of their insight and so forth. Um, the issue really was that in terms of, of assessment um, and, and high stakes exams and, and so forth, the answer I'm afraid is no. You know, it, it's, you know, well, I think what we have to remember is education is, is you know, it's like mass media and religion and the judicial system. It's just another structure in society designed to maintain the status quo. Um, you know, it, it's not education's role in society to change society. And, and it's, a, it's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but those, you know, it, it is a, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious, I'm not talking about the Illuminati, it's just talking about how societies form. And societies only really change when you have a, a, a cat, typically a catastrophic event you know, like a world war. I mean, we, the, the, the last century was, was littered with, with, with terrible warfare, although we're still continuing, actually, to, to, to the day. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's, it's quite hard to, to persuade policymakers and even educators now um, to go through cold turkey, which is what Joe was talking about, you know, sort of, you know, throw you in a room and feed you chicken soup and, and, until you sweat it out. Um, in terms of weaning ourselves off this, this existing system. And, you know, people say, well, how, you know, look, the question is, how can, we, how can we make that happen? I mean, I think, you know, societies um, vote in governments and, and, and so forth. I think we need to get more of the general public involved in the conversation around education. You know, like, you know, ask parents, why are you sending your kid to school? You know, we don't have that global public debate. The connected society that I'm talking about in this book isn't people hooked up to the internet. It's people talking to each other globally to have this debate. Of course, you're then working against the, the, the superstructures of, of mass media, you know, who, who will just assume that you're crazy. Why, why do we, you know, you, you must notice that the education pages in most newspapers are hidden away somewhere and people turn over them. The general public don't read those sections because education's boring. You know what I mean? You know, when you're at dinner party, I work in education, it's so, oh, do you know what I mean? Unless you're with other educators. And we've got to change that. We have to change that perception. I mean, you know, teachers are rock stars, really. I mean, don't, you know, don't, you want your kid being brought up by like, like, like an artist that's going to take them on amazing adventures. Don't we want that? I think that, so it's a long process. I think that it's, you know, we either have a catastrophic event, you know, which an asteroid hits the earth or something, and then suddenly we, 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 we come to our senses. I don't think the emergence of a digital economy, I think the digital economy has been over, overrated. Uh, yes, you know, what, what we're seeing is a, um, a concentration of wealth 
uh, being taken from the people and given to a very small number of people and, a very, and control of our consciousness being uh, given to five companies in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, we, I think we need an, uh, we need an uprising. But I, what I don't think is going to, I don't think that is a, is a change because the thing that these companies haven't changed is capitalism. You know, they haven't disrupted capitalism. In fact, they've perfected it. You know, they've, they've industrialized capitalism to such an extent uh, they're making money when they're asleep in, in bucket loads. These guys have more money than they know what to do with. It's obscene. So I think, you know, the, 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 I, you know what I did see, what gave me optimism was that I, I found, and they weren't hard to find, amazing, passionate practitioners everywhere in the world that were asking the same questions. It is, in this book, is, you, know, you look at this book and you, you, you find all these people working on the same puzzle. They've all got their piece of the puzzle. The thing is, we don't have the picture. And they're not, you know, they're not talking to each other enough yet. So it's, like a, it's almost like a, a dating book for these people to go and talk to each other. But that's happening globally. But how do we, you know, well, what we don't know is we haven't decided what the big picture is. We've forgotten what it's for. It's the, it's the goldfish bowl that Joe was mentioning earlier. We're just swimming around in this water and forgetting why we were there in the first place. I, uh, <clears throat> I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. That was great. I'm, I'm looking forward to digging deeper into your book. Um, with uh, th this idea of, of like your car the cartoons that you had there were fantastic. Uh, the, uh, the idea of rejecting fatalism and then uh, us having a say. How do, we, how do we shift or how do you work with, if, if your mindset is one that I'm, I'm here to help children grow into people who will make the world a better place, There'll be change agents and you know and leaders and good people. How do you uh, how do you how do you uh, have that conversation with someone whose mindset is we just need to prepare children to be successful in our current world? So it's almost like we need to do bad things to the kids now so they can get used to how bad the world is, and then we can and perpetuate it. How do we make that shift so that we can li live in the world we want to, not the one we have? I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I, some bits of it, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, Emma's right, which described me as a bit of an anarchist, um, although anarchy really means kind of sort of less government in some ways, it's, I mean, you know, it's the absence of government. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I believe in, I believe in the, the power of the people that is expressed through the state, if that makes sense, do you know what I mean? I mean, you know, we, we our democracies aren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, in fact, quite, sometimes they're quite harmful. Um, but I think you know, we, it's a very complex one because I think we need much greater engagement in, in politics from, from, from individuals. Do you know what I mean? It's another thing that's been sort of switched off, really. We've sort of disengaged from it. Um, but it is, you know, it is a system whereby change can happen because you know, we can have those conversations one by one. Do you know what I mean? You know, the ones that you're talking about. And I'm sure you're having them one by one, but it's how do you rapidly scale that? To, to, to reach change. Um, and I think that can only really happen through, through society and maybe, maybe a little anarchy. You know, you, know, it's, it's, you know, how can you do these things? I was, I was giving a similar talk, actually, to this one in Beijing, uh, which I thought was interesting, because I, I, they let me leave, uh, despite talking about some of these quite you know, sort of progressive ideas. But they were really interested in, in, in this, because the reality is, is that we do continue to hear this conversation about the future. You know, we never talk about the elephants in the room. You know, it's like, you know, what are we going to do when there's 11 billion people? I mean, I didn't make this figure up. I mean, it's, it's go and Google it, you find it. I mean, it's like I was at the UN when it was announced. It wasn't a surprise, there's 11 billion people in this century. There was 3 billion people when I was born. It's now just it's now over seven, so we let, you know, 11. I mean, you know, so many poor people, that's the thing I spotted I mean, it's, 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 someone was talking about comprehending and understanding the other day. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly how I felt. For a long time, I, it's really easy to be a sort of left-wing socialist in your kind of terraced house in southeast London, reading The Guardian. Do you know what I mean? And, and you know, just kind of you know, intellectualizing poor people. But when, you know, when, when I was living out in, in, in the refugee camps, when I was living out in, in, in the field, in India, and you, know, you see a child pull their, their lunch out of a rubbish tip, brush the flies off and eat it. You, know, you realize the scale of this problem. 
So I guess what I'm getting at is that it's, it's, we have challenges. This, 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 you know, as a society, our grandchildren could be the last, you know, this could be the last human century. And, and I think when we start having the debate and the dialogue and the conversation about what education's for, survival of the species has to be part of that. And, and in, so, so, you know, we, we can have the conversations. I mean, in STEM, for example, and, and education summits, you know, we, we constantly hear about education as part of the economic development plan. And OECD will always bring out Singapore as a good example of that. Um, you know, Singapore was, you know, in the, in the 60s, uh, post-colonial swamp. You know, it had, had unemployment, it had ethnic conflict, it had no housing, etc., etc., etc. Lee Kuan Yew came to power, the People's Action Party. There's never been a, you know, it's a, it's a single party democracy in Singapore. Curious expression, that. Um, but one thing that, that, that they did manage to do is they, 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 they used education as a, as a, they had a long term plan, which worked. But the, the plan was linked to this economic development goal. So it was the, the purpose of education for Singapore was to create, to, to, to deliver human capital, factory workers, and then train and train and train. And, and it became this economic superpower. And I'm not suggesting for a second that we do that because it doesn't really work long term. You've got, you know, Singapore is on the brink of civil unrest. Just trust me, the next 10 years, we're going to see, a, we're going to see something big happen there. And it's going to be shocking what will happen in Singapore. Um, I don't wish it on them, and I think they know it's coming, but it's like how do they re-engineer that society. But I think it's, it's, it, the point I've mentioned that is because for a couple of reasons. One, you know, we need to be, we, you know, OECD, I mean, you know, I'm sort of have a weird kind of relation. To, I mean, I see some of the benefits of what they're doing, but we have to remember that OECD was set up um, after the Marshall Plan, as part of the Marshall Plan, to prevent the creep of Soviet communism in Europe. Um, there's a clue in the name. It's about economic cooperation and development. It's about, it's about money. It's about economic determinism. And I think we have to be, we, have to, we could be concerned about that. And I think that, um, but the Singapore thing is that they, they decided what their challenge was. It was the first kind of design thinking, if you like, you know, designing an education system with a, with a clear goal. And I think that, you know, maybe once we, I think first of all, we have to express what these challenges are so people really get, you know, we spent the last 30 years debating climate change. Do you know what I mean? But we, you know, we're running out of time. And I think it's like if we can, as a society, figure out what the goals are, what are the challenges are. If we knew, for example, an asteroid was definitely going to hit the Earth, we would do something about it. You know, we would, you know, we would forget this idea of nationhood and, and all this kind of stuff and competition and so on. We'd, like, we're going to lift this together, everyone on the planet. And I think that, but these are real things that we know are happening. And if we, you know, if we, if we, if we took a, a, a project-based learning or even a problem-based learning approach to our global education system. Say, look, these are the things, guys, this is the, this is the top list. You know, I don't think increasing GDP would be in the top 10 if we really thought about it. Do you know what I mean? You know, extinction or loads of money. Someone will be doing that, though, I guarantee it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, if I get all the money on the planet and screw everyone, I could get a rocket to the moon and live there on my own. There's someone thinking that, you know, someone thinks it's a good idea to be the Uber of education. I mean, there's idiots everywhere. Um, but I think we need to, to look at the, 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 the issues that we face. And it can't, it can't all be doomsday stuff. Because as I said earlier, there's no point in saving the world if we're all bored. Or if we're unhappy. Or if we're angry. Or if we're stressed out. So I think it's about setting those goals. I'm, I'm sorry, long answer. I haven't given the, I haven't given the you know, because I, I, I think it's a bigger thing than just one conversation. It has to be a global conversation. I think, but I think society, us, our friends, our families and people have to be part of this conversation. And we have to somehow express the urgency of some of these global issues. Yeah. So, Brenda, uh, no, Mark. It's not me. No, it's me. Thanks, Graham. I really enjoyed that. Um, you've sort of addressed some of the what I was going to ask about in the last um, few minutes, but I, I just wanted to sort of pick up on one point. Um, we have witnessed in the last 60 years or so a transformation in the discourses that frame the way we live, and that includes education. Education is only a subset of that. I've just been reading a very interesting book by Owen Jones called The Establishment, where he's charted from a single meeting of economists post-Second World War how 
an unfashionable ideology has become the norm, how it's become um, so, so entrenched that anyone who criticizes it is seen as being mad. And one of the ways in which Owen Jones has, has articulated how this has happened is through what he calls outriders, people who have made it their long-term mission to go against the grain, to talk about this ideology, and gradually over time it has become more and more accepted until now it just permeates everything. So perhaps what we need is to, to have similar outriders whose job is to take the long view and work at a 50-year transformation of how we see public services. So we move away from seeing public services as products to be delivered, education, of course, being part of that. And, uh, you know, I, I talked yesterday about the language of delivery. I think that this is, is pervasive. And while we have these discourses, you cannot have a sane conversation that offers alternatives with somebody... Um, who is a senior administrator in education, for example, in the government or one of the government agencies, because they do not understand that there are alternative ways of revisioning education. And I think we need to have a long-term goal. And it can't just be done within education. It has to be done across society. I just agree. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, and, and I guess that's, you've articulated better than I was trying to earlier. Um, it's about deciding, you know, what if we designed society? What if, you know, what if we designed about our public services? It's an interesting idea, isn't it? I mean, everything, you know, we live in a built environment. You know, we know good design when we see it. You know? And if we were thinking about what society that we were designing, you know, what would it be? I mean, would it, would it, be, would it be what we've got now? Would it be um, an incredibly wealthy elite with enormous number of poor people? Is that what we would do? I mean, you know, would we, would we make it impossible for children in East Africa to have um, HIV and AIDS uh, medicine, which is what's happening at the moment? W would, we, would we have that? Would we design that? Into the, you know, actually say, right, like, we're going to provide uh, these pharmaceuticals for all these people, but not those black people, uh, those children over in there. Would we actually do that? Maybe some people would. I mean, there's people that go around cutting out holes in bedsheets and running around and stuff. Maybe they would. Um, but I think it's this idea of, of designing it, I think you're right, and having a long-term plan for that. Um, the problem is it's, it's sort of, sort of echoing Joe's earlier point, I mean, you know, the sort of competition that emerges. You know, there's this, we've got it into our head. I mean, it's like, you know, Silicon Valley is like the church of Ayn Rand. Do you know what I mean? You know, they really think we're much smarter than you, and, and therefore, you know, just let us take care of all this. And they're really not. Do you know what I mean? I mean, they're really not. And I think that's the problem, though, is this kind of belief that competition somehow is what gives us the struggle stimulus to, to, to be better, to be entrepreneurial and, and all that kind of stuff. It's complete nonsense. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, we, we, know, we need to lift it together. And I think a, a long-term plan, as you suggest, at a society level, through outriders and so forth, is, is what is necessary. It's a shame the Bilderberg Group aren't doing that, isn't it, really? Um, but they're obviously about making money. This is, uh, of course, a very complicated and uh, long conversation, and we might uh, want a special time for that. Uh, the reality, as always, is much more complicating uh, than we can imagine it. Mm. When we talk, and Joe addressed, and Kathy, and everyone can, no one can uh, deny that, for example, such a defining uh, area like inequality, poverty. Well, we try to talk outside of this, but this is what is defining. But not only this, we just were commenting with Eva, yeah? Uh, uh, during the uh, break, coffee break, that we think that uh, poverty can justify the failure of education and educational system. But let's see, the, starting two years ago already, the United States is trying to address the uh, field of uh, early age, pre-K-12 education, addressing exactly the core of the problem. 
uh, the poorest disadvantaged kids who come from a miserable environment and to get them out of there and they put in a more equal environment and give them the chance to, to start to become, to develop, to blossom. So you would think that this is what a fantastic approach. But the first calls, evidences from the states which already have been working one or two years with that, what they are doing in several places already, they are not working on special uh, uh, curriculums for kids on this particular develop made, uh, developmental uh, uh, level uh, uh, stage. On the contrary, what they start to do, they just pull out the early age, uh, the uh, first grades, let's say, primary education, and they pull it down to the tender kids, kinders, uh, well, children, pardon, uh, tender children who are absolutely not prepared to this and who needs absolutely different. What does it say us? It means that we can be uh, addressing the uh, question of uh, uh, inequality, poverty. But there is something which is even stronger than that evil. And during these two days, uh, the image in the name comes up for me personally, like under the world, the system. It's something which we kind of try to say that it's even impossible to break it really down. Someone uh, says we should work around the system. The other says we would find a way also. But what is that monster, the system? So that's what the reality uh, is about. But the best, the best way to uh, come back to the conversation, maybe to remember the words uh, of uh, Franklin uh, Roosevelt, who said that we have been always trying to design uh, the future for our children. It's time to educate them that they can design the future for themselves. Yeah. So you're welcome to give some uh, whom? Well, I think that's a good point because the, the, the issue there is, I mean, it, it, we have to enable young people to make the decisions that we've been unable to make. And we have to let them do it. The problem is, is we're not, you know, there are powerful structures to prevent that happening. Because um, our plans may be, uh, Graham, absolutely short vision. Hmm? Because the only thing which we know for sure, for certain, is the uncertainty hmm. of I remember, I mean, you, you got, you know, that's why, you know, you, you go to London um, and there's Buckingham Palace and Her Majesty and everything else. And there you've got the Royal Guard, you know, an army outside. Now, you have to ask why does a state official need an army? Um, you know, it's like all the elite require an army. And this is the thing. It's like as soon as you allow people to change society, they call out the guard. Um, and I think that's, 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 you know, I'm sorry to sort of, you know, any monarchists out there, it's not really meaning being, being anti-monarchy, I'm just saying that, you know, when you have a society based on theft, um, and, and, you know, if you're a multi-billionaire running a Silicon Valley company, that's theft, as far as I'm concerned. You control the army. And that's, a, you know, the, 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 this is why I'm saying it's really very powerful structures at place. And, you know, whilst I would love to have a global Bastille Day, um, I can't see that happening because we don't own the military. Yeah, so uh, the last uh, comment is for Brenda, please. Um, I'm a what to do on Monday morning kind of person. So um, I, 
I, I, Very good one. <laughs> well, uh, that's been most of my life trying to change something, but kind of. So uh, when I'm people a Friday say, evening person. Well, well, I'm still going on Friday <laughs> evening. <laughs> I haven't lost any steam by Friday evening. Um, no, but you, you know, I come from a society where we totally chucked out the old and we started mm. again in South Africa. What does democracy mean? How are we going to redesign? This to work hasn't been uh, entirely successful, I have to say. But it was an extremely interesting to see people uh, gathering around the idea of what democracy meant. And um, it didn't help to say, well, you know, we need to redesign the world, and when we finish redesigning the world, then we'll redesign the country, and when we finish redesigning the country, then we'll redesign the province, and then we'll do the institution, then we'll, then we'll do this project. Um, you have to start where you are and with what you can. And I have an opposite view, or probably not an opposite view, but a much more um, um, optimistic view of what technology can do. That we, it, we, which, and it's enabled us to do that which we could not do before. It has enabled us to become a much better democracy than we could be before. Because although democracy was, you know, a, a, a reasonable idea, it hasn't really been put into practice in any serious way in any place that I can think of. Um, it just uh, technology has enabled us to protest and gather and collaborate and form movements in a way that it couldn't before. So I would like you, somebody like you, an outlier of sorts. Uh, uh, and part of an on anarchy, by the way, is upsetting the, uh, the the norm. Is to create a movement. Um, your learning reimagined is a movement, and the more people join that movement, the more groundswell. Uh, you, you know, we've we've had the whole books talk, talking about groundswell. What you need is groundswell to change things. If you expect things to change from the top, and by the way, universities need to take some responsibility mm. in this. They're supposed to create leaders of the future. But I, I, I want groundswell. Yeah, yeah. Because then I know what to do on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah. So I could, uh, as you say, Eva, we could go on. But I don't think we, could, we should dismiss technology as a very big part of the solution. And, 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 I, and I, I, I certainly don't want to leave you the impression that I was in any way anti-technology. Um, I was actually... Your laugh demonstrates that. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, and I agree with you, it's using, you know, using technology for what it can be good for. Um, and, and movements and, I mean, the interesting thing about it, I, I did a spell working in the adult industry uh, for a while. You won't find it on my CV. Um, and, and the thing about the adult industry, it's really interesting really, it's about niches. Do you know what I mean? There's people that are into feet and there's people that are into noses or whatever. And it aggregates those people and creates movements, do you know what I mean? And I think in a way, um, that's, what the, the, that's what the internet's good for and the digital technology are good for. And that's what I'm talking about when I mean the connected society and how we can transform learning. I think it's a beautiful comment and very powerful one, uh, which Brenda said, that of course, doomsday and complexity and whatever, but if we create movement, a team where the Friday evening person and Monday morning one work together. And this book, I believe, is a very strong and powerful voice which could be calling uh, uh, all us together. So uh, the thing that we really, our role as educators is to work on what we can do. I think it could be already serious, uh, inspirational message for us. And we have to finish this session. Uh, luckily, uh, we are, uh, luckily we still hope and we agreed with Graham to work together more on this issue. And uh, uh, Brenda is also a person who is in our team by being a oh, member of our yeah, academic committee. So, 
uh, will work on this more. And so next, our 